This is Stride 8 Search of my book, Peace Before Increase by Dr. Amanda K. Cruz, Matthew 20, 1 to 16, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius, the typical daily wage of a day laborer at the time for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired at about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who has hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The entire gospel is encapsulated here. What an alluring illustration of our salvation. This parable hones in on the fact that we can't gain faith through work alone. Everyone is able to receive the same eternal reward no matter when they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. This message is similar to the parable of the prodigal son as told in the Gospel of Luke. Those who relate closest to the oldest brother in the prodigal son, who was consistently faithful yet went uncelebrated, may be tempted to think the longer they're faithful to God, the greater the prize they deserve. But that isn't so. God willingly and freely offers the same chance at salvation, whether we're poor or wealthy, employed or unemployed, exuberant or sullen, loquacious or circumspect, saved as a youngin or saved on our deathbeds. By the grace of God, through the ultimate sacrifice of his son, we are all given the opportunity to enter the vineyard, the kingdom of heaven. As we saw with Naaman in the Jordan River, receiving that salvation takes a decrease of self and an increase of hope in things one cannot see. When you're in need of hope, search for it. Don't lay in your bed expecting a dove to carry a letter of hope to you in its beak. Not saying God can't and won't do that. I'm just saying to take an active role in your own transformation. If you're out in the middle of the ocean, you're absolutely going to pray to God to save you, but you're also going to do your part to kick your feet. If you, like me, are in a glorious waiting season, I encourage you to focus or to force yourself to kick your feet every day. Expect that the Lord uses this season to make something entirely new in you. You'll have some euphoric highs and some dispiriting lows, but keep moving toward Jesus and away from the past. Some days you'll be sprinting to him, and on other days you might barely be crawling to him. Either brings delight to the Father. He sees and is proud of your efforts. Just two days after my sacred wait began, my husband ensured we got ourselves to a midweek church service. As soon as an altar call was announced, I beelined for the front. God embraced me that night through a powerful prayer partner who authoritatively shared these words with me. 
The enemy is telling you that you'll be removed from your job, but that is not God. You're stressing and searching for jobs without remembering that God's in this. He's here. He's present. Those words have been branded on my heart since. As I've been strengthening my spiritual life throughout this golden waiting period, God has given me confidence to pursue the encouragement I need. He has grown my hope by blessing me with interactions with fellow believers who have shared amazing testimonies with me of times in their own lives that they've chosen to follow Christ instead of others or themselves. Before this, I would rarely seek to begin conversations with others regarding faith because I usually did a fine job of talking myself out of conversing with other Christians. I would think they were better than me. Their lives were better than mine. Their loads were lighter than mine. I was intimidated. However, the more people I talked to, the more I realized that everyone goes through junk. I'm not the only one. Thinking I'm the only one is believing a lie from the devil. Looking back, my avoidance of any conversations with fellow believers beyond how are you was probably one of the devil's schemes too. He played me like a fiddle. He tried to eradicate my memory of Nehemiah 8.10, which encourages all believers to muzzle toxic thoughts by professing the joy of the Lord is our strength. Before I got the call from my work about taking a paid semester off from teaching, still in awe of God over this, a simple hug with a fellow homeschool mom who met up with me on her own volition inspired me to open like a flower blooming after a long winter. With utmost compassion, this mom assured me that it's okay to lay my burdens down and let others help me carry them. At that fragile point, I was already falling apart and I hadn't even gotten the news yet about how drastically my world would soon change. This mom told me that she could empathize with me because she knows what it's like to work full time while attempting to keep a marriage, home, and homeschool intact. She told me of her own past trials, like her and her husband's loss of a baby while into the second trimester of pregnancy, the loss of consistent income, the loss of a car, and even the loss of a little roof over their head. Do you know what she told me she and her husband did once when their roof caved in on their house in the middle of pouring rain? They embraced one another and danced. The joy of the Lord is their strength. Another woman I heard about on our Christian radio station shared that she royally upset her husband one morning when pancakes she left too long on the stove scented their whole house with a staggering burnt aroma. As she took the pancakes outside to the trash, her husband was so furious that he called her an explicative and locked her out of the house. Mind you, she was barefoot and without water or keys in the 114 degree Texas sun, but she didn't re retaliate in anger. Oh no, she simply walked around to the side door, let herself in and gently said, honey, just a heads up that I'm entering the side door. The grace of this woman astounds me. She is too close to God to allow petty behaviors of her husband to bring her down. The joy of the Lord is her strength. During another instance of fellowship, I listened to tales of my of one mom's life before moving this far south. We live in the Rio Grande Valley, right on the Texas-Mexico border. She used to live further north in metropolitan middle America, where she thought she had it all. Granted, in order for her to stay home and homeschool her children, her husband had to work two jobs back to back and wasn't getting home until later and later each night. She thought they were making it. Sure, they were coasting along, but he was utterly exhausted. He was burning out. Until one day, the Lord allowed the rug to be ripped out from under them. This mom's husband is from Mexico and did not have paperwork to legally reside here in the States. He was pulled over in a traffic stop that would eventually lead to his deportation from the country. This family ended up moving to a popular city in Mexico just across the border from deep south Texas where I live. God eventually provided the wife with the best of both worlds. She received a job as a nurse where she would only have to work on weekends and could be present homeschooling her kids during the week. And her husband, 
he became a full-time stay-at-home dad. Both had their fears before settling into this new reality. The husband was not looking forward to 24-7 daddy duty, and my friend was not looking forward to leaving everything she knew to now live in Mexico. In fact, she told me she fought God on this for a whole year before she finally started to accept glimpses of God's beautiful plan. He worked the bad out for good. Now she and her husband are both equally active and present in the rearing of their children and lack for nothing. The joy of the Lord is their strength. After morning, a morning meeting in our homeschool community about two weeks into this miraculous wait, I remember uncontrollably sobbing while singing the Trinitarian doxology inspired by 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The lyrics say, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. From the depth of my soul, that day, I declared Psalm 38, 9 over my circumstances by voicing, Lord, you know all my desires and deepest longings. My tears are liquid words and you can read them all. In the same breath, drawn to say this prayer, I received a text from a sister in Christ telling me, girl, I could totally see you as an author. She was a bucket carrying his living water to me right when I needed it most. The joy of the Lord is her strength. That same day, a fellow homeschool dad told me he unexpectedly lost his job of many years, and yet he, his wife, and their two beautiful daughters have never gone without. This dad was given a position of leadership in his church and takes it upon himself to sell baked goods and bracelets to support his family. It's hard labor, and people can be ruthlessly mean, but the joy of the Lord is his strength. Before a service, our son invited us to a pastoring couple currently ministering out of a borrowed church and seeking to open their own church told me their family of five once made it on a mere $15,000 a year. According to them, their cups were overflowing, not because of income, but because the favor of God was on their lives. They said to this day, they have way more than should be possible on what they have earned as ministers. They are living proof that in times of economic or family difficulty, the Lord's blessings are promised to those who faithfully pay their tithe. The joy of the Lord is their strength. Within the first week of this waiting season, gifted to me by God, I had a dream of the face of a new woman who joined our homeschool community. I woke up knowing God wanted her to pray with me. The very next day, when our community got together, I stayed for lunch, which was radical in and of itself because I typically avoid socializing. As a public school teacher, I tended to avoid the lunchroom out of fear that I'd get involved in gossip or friendships that could lead to disappointment. This tendency followed me into my role as a homeschool parent, so even though I knew there was someone I hoped to see that day, I wasn't about to go looking for this woman who I hardly knew. As fellow homeschool families consumed their lunches, I awkwardly shuffled back and forth between inside and outside with my kids until finally I saw an empty seat on a bench next to a fellow mom near the playground. I asked her if she minded if I sat there. She didn't mind, and as God would have it, unbeknownst to me, this woman I sat with is close with the woman I saw in my dream. So, before I knew it, Walking straight toward me was the woman who I knew needed to pray with me. I briefly explained my circumstances and asked if she could speak any hope into my life. She had just the story. She said years before becoming a parent to her two adopted children, she and her husband had a beloved dog who they deeply cared for. She loved this dog so much, in fact, that she would take him everywhere with her. She bought a car with a special hatchback just for her dog. She took her dog to the park with her, to stores with her, everywhere, and one day she got devastating news that he had cancer and the veterinarian estimated he had six months left to live. 
She and her husband vowed to make it the best six months they could. Lamentably, things progressed from bad to worse quicker than expected. They had to take their dog in for a blood transfusion and he died on the operating table. She was beside herself with grief. She knew she was losing him, but she didn't know he was going to die so soon. And she had secretly wished she could have preserved a stamp of his paw print as a memory of him. She didn't share this with anyone because it didn't matter anymore. Now her only idea of a memory of him was his collar, so she got in her car and started to drive to the veterinarian to see if maybe she could retrieve it, but her husband ultimately talked her out of it. He didn't want her emotions to dominate her, and it was quite possible that they didn't keep the collar, which would only heighten her disappointment. She listened to her husband and returned home to grieve with him until one day in the mail came a package with a beautifully written note from the vet about the incredible qualities her dog had. Obedient, loyal, and patient were some of the words they used to describe her dog. Then the letter said that they felt in their hearts that they should send her her dog's collar and a stamp of his paw print something that only God knew she longed for. She said in this moment, she learned that God, the God she grew up knowing who loves his people and loves his church also loved her individually and wanted a personal intimate relationship with just her. The joy of the Lord is her strength. After hearing this woman's testimony and praying with her, I was so excited to continue pressing into the Lord, reassembling or resembling Forrest Gump conversing with each passerby on a park bench at this point. Beside me, next came another woman, whom I greatly admired. This woman told me not to forget that we make plans, but God directs our steps. She homeschools as well, and her husband works as a traveling doctor. It was looking like he was going to have to be gone for all of January to make ends meet until the Lord supplied him with an unexpected pay increase of an extra $400 per hour, per hour. Because of that hug from God, he would start the new year with his family instead. The joy of the Lord is this family's strength. A young girl I mentored from our church's youth service was terribly ashamed of her curves because other teams constantly reminded her that she wasn't slim like most other girls her age. To make things even worse, she loved hunting with her dad and often dressed in camouflage. She was teased for looking more like a boy than a girl. The bullying she experienced got bad enough that the only solution she could think of was to end her own life. Thankfully, she didn't follow through. One night at about two in the morning, the Lord prompted me to text her a video of a Craig Groeschel sermon. She watched it, gave her life to the Lord, and asked to sign up to be baptized at our church the following week. And guess what? Her parents and siblings were all so inspired by the changes they saw in her that they wanted to get baptized too. So the whole family was baptized together. The joy of the Lord is their strength. A man from Western Australia came to speak at a church I visited. He lost his dad to a heart attack at the age of seven and was furious with God. He ended up joining a gang, and at the age of 17, he and his gang went to see Billy Graham while on tour so they could kill him. But as God would have it, nine out of the ten gang members accepted the Lord as their savior before that could happen. This man recalls God himself asking him, Why are you really here? And then assuring him, I didn't take your dad away from you. I love you. Now the joy of the Lord is his strength. When Hussein and I visited a healing conference at Karis Bible College in Woodland Park, Colorado, out of the hundreds of others in the attendance, a prophet spoke a word specifically for Hussein to expect double for our trouble in the coming year. While this was happening, I met a woman who God sent to the conference just for me. We met sitting across from one another on lobby couches. I'd excused myself from the conference to nurse my newborn daughter who was and was drawn to this woman's angelic glow. The God in her is so pronounced. We lightly discussed the message being shared before she began walking away. I felt an irrefragable tug in my soul 
to stop her so I could collect her contact information. Once I stopped her, she said she was waiting for me to ask. She proceeded to inform me that she was in between assignments as a traveling nurse and was only in Colorado for that weekend. She wasn't even there to attend this conference. She was convicted to change her plans that night and said with certainty that it was because God wanted to align her path with mine. She has been a devoted prayer partner of mine ever since. I cannot tell you how many times she has followed a conviction from the Lord to check on me in the perfect moments when I most need to be reminded of God's love for me. She is a godmother I have grown to deeply cherish. A dear friend from my church once found herself in a loveless marriage. Married to a high school sweetheart since a young age, she and her husband shared two sons, but she often felt her husband only paid mind to his work and his role as a provider but not to his role as a friend or a confidant to his wife. Eventually, the missing pieces were fill, fulfilled by another man whom she began an affair with. Ultimately, her husband found out and they divorced. Her husband would tell you he never lost hope of their reconciliation until she had to reveal to him something that he already knew deep in his spirit. She was pregnant by the other man. Remarkably, he still did not turn his back on her. He continued to pursue God and never abandoned his tutelage for his by then ex-wife. Throughout her pregnancy, he would check on her, bring her food, hold her stomach, and care for her as if the baby was his. Hold on. Rosie girl woke up. As God would have it, immediately after the birth of what would be the first and only girl in their family, they reconciled against all odds. They remarried, added one more son to the kin, and now served the Lord by helping other married couples stay married. They have seen and known that marriage is worth fighting for. The joy of the Lord is their strength. Another woman we met through marriage ministry shared that she and her husband were brought together at a young age as well but he was not ready to commit to the woman God chose for him. So he left her and began a situationship with another woman with whom he had two daughters. After much growth that needed to happen before he would be ready for the right one, God completely transformed him. And then he returned to the woman of his dreams. They married and as God would have it, welcomed two sons together. They wouldn't tell you life is always a cakewalk because Consequences of disobedience have left a residue to be dealt with, but their unshakable faith helps them persevere. The joy of the Lord is their strength. This past Christmas, I, along with some friends and family members, decided to look into sponsoring a child at an orphanage in Cozumel, Mexico, that we had the privilege of visiting during a recent trip. After background checks and application materials were all vetted and accepted, the director emailed me a list of names of ages and ages of orphans who weren't fully supported yet. It typically takes 10 sponsors to financially cover all the needs of one child. My kids and I prayed about it, and then my oldest son, Adam, said the Lord gave him a name, Jose. I hadn't shown Adam the list. It only had six or seven names total, and one of them was indeed Jose. He seemed like one less likely to be chosen by other sponsors because he was the oldest orphan on the list. He's already an adult, actually, and attending school to become a pastor. Not only that, but Jose's name was only the only name typed in red. To this day, I still have no idea why, but when I showed Adam, every hair follicle on both of our bodies stood straight up. We were reminded of when Jesus speaks in the Bible, words directly from him are written in red. And there's more. Jose's middle name is Rafa, reminding us of Jehovah Rapha. One of the seven names of God shared in the Old Testament. It means the God that heals. Wow, what a hug from God. In the healing season we are in, that was so huge for us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Another constant reminder that God heals us is in the name of our newest daughter. While pregnant with her, we ran a blood test to find out her gender as we 
had with all of our other children without fail. This time, the 99.9% .9 accurate blood gender test said we were having a boy, so after prayerful consideration, as a whole family, we decided to name this baby Josiah, meaning God supports and heals us. When we committed to this name, we had no idea how much it would impact us in the season to come. After an ultrasound imaging toward the end of my pregnancy refuted the findings of the blood test, we didn't know what to believe and just left it in God's hands until delivery. I brought boy and girl clothes to the birth with me just in case and voila, we had a baby girl. We still love the name God led us to, so Josiah simply became Josie. Shout out to her godparents, Ted and Lori Burns, for aiding in that decision. Josie is a beautiful, constant reminder that God is healing our whole family. And yes, in case you're wondering, the company who supplied the blood test sent us a full refund once we showed them her birth certificate. That refund, along with another unexpected refund, came in clutch timing just recently when we woke up to a water heater mess. Our entire downstairs was flooded, but the God who supports and heals knew this was coming and sent provision. Hallelujah. He even brought a surprise guest, a friend of a friend, to my women's Bible study that same day who was visiting from across the country but had a testimony of perseverance to share. She'd spent seven years moving from adjunct job to adjunct job before receiving the permanent role she now has in higher education. Seven years! Yet, she never missed a bill, even when she wasn't sure if she'd be teaching or not. I was taken aback by her steadfast dependence on the Lord. We know unquestionably when things like this happen, we are covered because of our tithe. Take care of the kingdom and the Lord will take care of you. The joy of the Lord is our strength. In an unforgettable sermon, I heard the story of a pastor whose granddaughter's hair got caught in a filter while swimming in a pool. By the time the other children noticed, it was already too late. They screamed for help, and her father jumped in, untangled her hair, and lifted her limp body onto the deck. 911 was called, and EMTs came to work on her, but couldn't find a pulse. They were just about to call in a body and they'd be, that they'd be bringing in dead on arrival when the father loudly and probably crazily to the outside world yelled, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. No, you cannot have my daughter. We claim tither's rights in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just as soon as he let out this blood-curdling yell from the depths of his soul, the little girl woke up and stood up. A true miracle. She did not go for examination at the hospital, or she did go, but no injuries would, were found. She was perfectly well. What a testament to the promise exhibited in Malachi 3.11. The joy of the Lord is that Father's strength. A preacher we received prayer from on a day that Hussein's head pain intensified told us about a time that he was struck, or that he struck a deer while driving home from a revival. He was so full of the Holy Spirit at that time that immediately after the impact, he and his friend retrieved praise flags from the trunk and began dancing in the streets unto the Lord right in front of his badly damaged vehicle. Jesus is getting me a new car, he proclaimed in faith. How I adored his zest. With all his heart, mind, and soul, he believed what he said. And sure enough, with a tax refund and the exact amount he'd need for a new car, Jesus delivered. I remember him saying he never once allowed himself to wonder, why did this have to happen to me? Instead, he thanked God that it happened to him, the one getting a tax refund as opposed to another driver who wouldn't have had the means to fix or purchase another vehicle. A family from my former home church took a leap of faith after the pandemic and started their own business. Before their consignment shop ever opened, they gave their church 10% tithe off of every means of income they had. As God would have it, during their opening month, the local newspaper asked to put their consignment shop on the front page free of charge. They knew that had to be God. After this front page appearance, customers poured in and their sales have been higher than they could have ever imagined. The joy of the Lord is their strength. A woman I met at a Christian concert found out she was laid off from her job where she worked for 14 years. Sure, fear crept into her thoughts, but she claimed her tither's rights aloud each day since learning this news and within a week, she received a 26 week severance, a package of additional pay 
for an employee's past work that is given at the end of the employee's employment and a job offer for a new position paying double what she made in the old position. The joy of the Lord is her strength. I love how Pastor Bill Winston explains the correct perspective of tithing. A tithe does not become a tithe when we give it and becomes a tithe when we get it. The moment we receive a paycheck, it becomes a tithe, not when we bring it to the house of God. Those who tithe have seeds in the ground, and those who don't tithe do not. Those seeds are called tithers' rights, and they are found in Malachi 3, 10 through 12. Amid my blessed wait, the Lord led me to search for these verses in the Amplified Bible, Classic Edition. Tithers' right number one, provision. The Lord provides for tithers. Malachi 3.10 gives the following instructions. Bring all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now by it, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. In Hebrew... Windows mean floodgates, thus indicating that when we give our tithes as the Lord has commanded, our biggest blessings of all will be bestowed upon us, bigger blessings than we can fathom. I love that in this verse, Father God says, prove me, as if to challenge us to test him. Tithers get... Sorry, trying to breastfeed. To experience supernatural increase and overflow known to no one else. Proverbs 3, 9 to 10 instructs us, Honor the Lord with your capital and sufficiency from righteous labors, and with the first fruits of all your income, so shall your storage place be filled with plenty, and your vats shall be overflowing with new wine. Tithers write number two. Protection. The Lord protects tithers. Malachi 3.11 renders this assurance. And I will rebuke the devourer, insects, and plagues for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine drop to fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. With tithing comes shelter from the enemy who is here to kill, steal, and destroy. When under attack, tithers get to proclaim this verse against the enemy, rebuking him. When we give God what is rightly his, he protects every single thing that we do and own. Tithers right number three, promotion. The Lord promotes tithers. Malachi 3.12 confirms that, stating, And all nations shall call you happy and blessed, for you shall be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. This speaks to the grace and favor given to tithers. The Lord creates a magnetic pull for tithers. Success gravitates toward them. They are de destined for greatness. Other people and opportunities are attracted to them and find joy in their increase. Their happiness is attractive too because it's not external. It comes from within. Amid this valued weight, my family and I memorized an intrepid prayer from Pastor John Hagee that reminds us of rights to our rights to provision, protection, and promotion. And it goes like this. Heavenly Father God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come before you today as your children, seeking your divine favor. Lord God, your favor surrounds the righteous. In faith believing, we receive the favor of God now in every dimension of our life. Let the favor of God rest upon every member of our family. Let your favor rest upon our health, our finances, and our relationships. Lord God, from this day forward, we're going to receive the limitless favor of God, supernatural increase, promotion, restoration, honor, spiritual victories, petitions granted, and battles won that we don't have to fight. The favor of God is upon us, goes before us, and therefore our life will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Through a deep soul search, this prayer in accompaniment with the countless testimonies shared with me from others throughout the week, I've come to realize how irrational 
my worry about work has been a job's a job. I can't take it with me, but I do take my soul. What about you? What blessings do you imagine God has for you on the other end of your perseverance? Life Application Challenge 8. If your heart is set on becoming or remaining wealthy, it will keep you from following the Lord. Give God his 10% off of every dollar you receive. Invite someone older and wiser in the Lord than you out to coffee and ask them to share stories with you of the times the Lord brought them out of a wilderness. Be encouraged that if God did it for them, he can do it for you. Romans 12, 4-5 says that's because we are better together than we are alone. Lyrics to Isaiah's pick, My Story, His Glory by Kids on the Move. Sometimes the simplest lyrics provoke the biggest wake-up calls. Every time my youngest son Isaiah tells me, Mommy, play na 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 pui. I don't know who it's better for, him or me. It refreshes my soul to watch Isaiah become consumed by the peace of God as he stomps on Satan with his feet like Romans 16, 20 proclaims we should. Isaiah, whose name means God's salvation and restoration, loves to dance, dance, dance for Jesus and stomp, stomp, stomp the devil. When Isaiah entered our world, it had been nearly five years since we had a little one in the house. With him came renewed faith and restored hope for the future. The joy of the Lord is his strength. And the lyrics say, we all have a story, a purpose you designed every day, every page written for me by the love of Jesus Christ. So listen up, listen up now. We're shouting, living every day to praise your name. Jesus, let my life be your story. I'm alive to live a life that shines your light. So listen up, listen up now. I'm living out loud. Jesus, let my life be your story. You're the one I want my life to celebrate because you give life to me. Let my story, every page, bring glory to Jesus' name. 